Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to Tom, thank you to Michael. Um, I've been coming to the Institute for many years, but this is the first time I've been elevated to the top table, so I'm uh, touched and, and honoured by that. Uh, so I, I'm trying to give a, a quick um, overview of the of the negotiations, uh, what they were about, and um, and also where we might be going from here, what, what happens next, as it were. Um, and uh, I suppose the, the first question is, why have, why have goals at all? What is the value of any development goals? And, and there is a, a debate about this. Um, but on balance, uh, uh, the view is that they are a useful um, signal of, of priorities uh, uh, which governments across the world have uh, have adopted. Um, um, the Millennium Development Goals, which is really the only precedent we have, um, had a mixed scorecard, but it, in overall terms, one could say that uh, significant progress was made in some of them and very little in another. But uh, the general discipline of having a set of goals to guide um, development efforts over a given period, that that was uh, accepted and, and is still accepted uh, with a slight degree of scepticism. Um, what is different about these goals compared with the Millennium Development Goals? There are really three um, essential differences. One is that the, the MDGs, just to, to abbreviate them, focused on poverty eradication. There were only eight of them, and um, in effect they amounted to the developed world uh, gently telling the um, uh, developing world uh, what they needed to do in order to receive um, uh, overseas development assistance. It was very much an agenda for developing countries. This time around, the agenda is vast. Uh, it, it, uh, it includes poverty eradication, but it also covers um, protecting the planet, um, creating uh, a, a better environment, um, and it also includes creating conditions for balanced economic growth. So these are, these are the three dimensions of what has now been termed sustainable development. I should say um, uh, on terminology that this, the, the phrase sustainable development may be understood uh, by the conoscenti, but in fact it's not easily uh, understood by most people in the street as it were. So we did toy with finding some replacement for it during the negotiations, uh, and there is still a lively debate on that subject, um, principally involving the UK, because uh, David Cameron, this is a slight aside, but David Cameron had been appointed by, um, uh, by Ban Ki-moon to a task force about two years ago, which looked at um, uh, the, the sustainable development issues. And Cameron became deeply immersed in the subject matter and, and is to this day um, with all kinds of views about the number of goals and, and, uh, and so on. But in particular, he feels that the phrase sustainable development doesn't work. Happily, he didn't actually attract a majority on that. Most people felt that one way or another, we have to stay with the concept of sustainable development. We worked so hard to actually create a consensus around it that even if it's slightly obscure, uh, the, the view is that it would gradually become clearer. Um, the MDGs themselves, for example, the Millennium Development Goals, that phrase meant little or nothing 15 years ago. In the meantime, it's, it's widely accepted. So the view is that the, or the hope is, that the Sustainable Development Goals as a concept will become gradually easier for people to, to, to use. But I just mentioned passing that um, global goals was the term uh, which um, Cameron and others uh, preferred, and one sees that still in uh, some of the NGO activity since the goals were were um, implemented, but or since they were adopted. But let's just say that uh, sustainable development has three dimensions: the economic, social, and environmental. And each of the goals and the targets is meant to reflect in itself all three dimensions. And that's a, a tricky thing, but it is seen to be the way, the way forward. In the, in the formulation of the declaration, which accompanies the new goals and targets, again, great care had to be taken to demonstrate that we were not reverting to what is seen as a silo mentality of just health, just energy, just environment, but rather that we were uh, 
genuinely moving forward on the basis of an integrated approach which tackles all three dimensions simultaneously. If you want to achieve uh, uh, poverty eradication, then you, you cannot just, you have to look at all three dimensions together, and th that is the essence of sustainable development. Um, so the first key difference from the MDGs is the scale of this new agenda. It is vast. It's reflected in the fact that there are 17 goals and 169 targets, which you, you, the word target really means subsidiary goals. So under, for example, the education goal, there might be eight individual targets, um, uh, sexual, uh, uh, children's education, adult education, etc. And um, all that's why you, get, you come up with 169 targets. So this framework is unwieldy in a sense. Uh, 17 is, is an awkward number, but it turned out to be 17 because of the earlier negotiation process to which Michael referred, which was called the Open Working Group. That involved just 30 countries, and it met for a six-month period uh, up till the summer of 2014, and it produced draft goals and targets. It produced proposals for goals and targets, which the entire UN membership was then supposed to negotiate. So where Ireland came in was that we were uh, co-chairing or co-facilitating the wider process involving 193 member states. But the open working group, as it was called, was, if you like, a, a test tube approach. We were taking 30 countries and having them meet slightly more informally to see what might constitute the new goals. Out of that process came 17 goals. Uh, and efforts were made to reduce them to 15 uh, or even to 10. They got nowhere because every country was uh, every country had its own set of priorities. And uh, for example, if Britain felt that there, that, they, that there should be only 12 goals or 10, France was equally determined that there should be 17. Why? Because France feared that um, climate change, or that the one dealing with climate change might be one to be dropped. And France obviously attaches huge importance to um, uh, the climate change aspect of the agenda. So for every country proposing a reduction, there were many, many others saying, leave it as it is. That approach, in fact, prevailed altogether because we had 17 goals and 169 targets coming out of the open working group process. As we moved into the wider uh, negotiation, in which every country in the world basically was uh, expected to sign up to the, the new goals, it was clear that the developing countries, um, and they constitute a block of 134, although they, somewhat uh, awkwardly they're called the Group of 77. So the 77 has never in fact been uh, updated to 134. But 134 out of 193 clearly shows the the, uh, the, the uh, center of gravity within the negotiations, that uh, the, the G77, uh, for that read almost twice as many, um, uh, were in a fairly pivotal position in terms of um, making demands about the final outcome. The G77 did not want to change a comma in the, uh, in the goals and targets. And the reason for that was, was quite simple. They were afraid that if you did change a comma, you would start pulling at the ball of wool and uh, uh, everything else would unravel. That was perhaps a slightly dramatic um, assumption they were making or um, unnecessarily alarmist, but it, it was deep in their psyche. Even the slightest change would mean that the entire edifice constructed during the open working group phase would, would collapse. Um, and they felt that they had got it into a state which was as good as it could be. They didn't want to run any risks. That meant that even relatively um, uh, simple technical adjustments to um, the, 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 the targets, which many European countries favoured, uh, became an object of great uh, contention. Uh, one of the problems was that in the final phase of the Open Working Group, the, um, the negotiations, uh, or the, the, the new goals and targets were rushed through, and a number of them hadn't been properly uh, um, uh, reflected on. So there was a good technical case for improving a number of them, but the developing countries feared that uh, any so-called improvement would in fact be uh, 
uh, a, a, it would amount to a reworking of the entire framework. So it, we try, eventually my, my colleague and I managed, despite all that, to get a number of changes made uh, of a technical nature, um, but it still ended up as 17 goals and 169 targets. So this uh, framework taken together and with the addition of a, a, an inspiring, uh, uh, hopefully inspiring declaration at the beginning, and with the addition of material about the, the, the resources needed to implement the goals, and also about the monitoring arrangements, putting, it, put, putting all that together and you have the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So it's simply called the 2030 Agenda, and that replaces um, the phrase post-2015 as Michael was saying, technically the new agenda only comes into effect uh, on the 1st of January, uh, um, but effectively it is already with us and it has been formally uh, adopted as of last month. Where did Ireland come in? Um, uh, I mean, Michael has alluded to, to some of the, the, um, the, the previous history. We obviously have a reputation for having a very strong development cooperation programme over many years, and uh, um, uh, we are seen as um, uh, an, uh, an honest broker, a, a good mediator between the Global North and the Global South at the UN. Um, and uh, we did have the, um, an earlier involvement co-chairing um, a, a summit on the Millennium Development Goals, which took place in, in September 2013. Um, it would be fair to say that other countries w would have been interested in the same uh, appointment and um, uh, there were excellent candidates uh, among them, but one way or another it, it, it fell to us. And um, we got going about, uh, about a year ago. Um, the structure of the negotiations was that we had, on average, a week uh, per month. Um, and uh, that meant that you had uh, up to 500 people in the room at any given time. You have, you have 193 member states, each usually with one or two people. You also had a significant um, representation of civil society at the back of the room, and by that I mean NGOs of every conceivable agenda and description and nationality. Um, uh, we, my, my Kenyan colleague and I, um, arranged for a structured engagement with civil society uh, on one one day during the five days uh, of our session, and that would mean we would bring them down literally from the back of the room and put them into the body of the room and have the delegates interacting directly with them. And this was the first time this had been done. Um, uh, on occasion, um, some of the NGOs were of a rather um, exotic uh, background. So, I, I, on one occasion, I remember sta <coughs> staring at four gentlemen in Indian. Um, headdresses in front of me, and I had to keep on saying to myself, this is indigenous society from Alaska or something, but this is an example of the um, unexpected uh, um, variety of um, civil society that you would find uh, in front of you. Um, but they would engage directly with, with delegates um, uh, on topics that had been agreed in advance, and um, they were happy with that. But then there came a point towards the end of our negotiation when ordinarily civil society would have been excluded because the G77 traditionally uh, feel enough is enough. They don't want the extra pressure of having NGOs wagging their fingers at them, um, and they normally ask for NGOs to be excluded. On this occasion, somehow we managed to distract them, and between one thing and another, the NGOs stayed in the room until the very end. That was gratifying for one particular reason. It meant that the NGOs had complete ownership of the final document. They did not feel that it was somehow ultimately being negotiated behind the scenes by government uh, officials. Rather, they were able to interact, for example, by coming down in the intervals to talk to uh, delegates. So they had a real sense of contributing. And they therefore have described this as the most um, open negotiation process that ever took place uh, at the UN, and unfortunately they now, they, they now see this as the standard to be maintained on all future occasions, and uh, I'd be pleasantly surprised if that were to uh, happen, but one way or another it happened in our process, and uh, it does perhaps set a good example. Another thing which, uh, I mean, I'll come back in a moment to what the particular challenges were in, the, in, the, um, uh, in, in terms of substance, but 
there is also a long-standing um, pattern at the UN whereby in big negotiations like this, the two co-chairmen or co-facilitators, as they are called, um, are also in effect sidelined uh, towards the end because the group of 77, the developing countries, feel unnerved by, um, usually by the northern representative. They feel that their own interests will be undermined and they, they basically say, enough, we want you guys out of the place and instead they insist on having the text of the final agreement put up on a screen and they then um, ask to have various uh, amendments uh, put up on the screen. So you shortly, within a few, when that gets going, it becomes a chaotic uh, negotiation process, complete paralysis, because there's nobody there to m move things forward. Somehow, my Kenyan colleague and I managed to avoid that fate, and we, we maintained the same pattern to the end. That's to say, we put a draft on the table, we listened to comments, we went away, revised the draft, went back with the next draft, put that on the table, and I think it was our fifth draft which was a fin finally adopted. So that is an old-fashioned way of doing it, but it has actually restored hope at the UN in multilateral diplomacy because the feeling is that we, as a collectivity of 193 countries, were able to get this agreement across the line in a traditional way without, uh, in other words, with two chairs who held the pen, as they say, held the pen till the end. So that was uh, encouraging in its own way. What were the big big issues or, or challenges? I, again, I, I'll try not to be too technical, but, but one of them was the, um, there is a phrase, um, common but differentiated responsibilities. Now, this is a phrase drawn from the Rio conference of 1992, which began the whole process uh, of uh, leading to sustainable development. And that phrase is interpreted by the global north, by the developed countries, as applying only to climate change. That means that, if you like, uh, industrialized countries would accept that they carry a certain debt towards uh, developing countries uh, in relation to the impact of climate change. But the developing countries in the meantime have taken the view that that phrase applies to the whole development agenda. So if you like, it would mean that uh, the same industrialized countries would have to accept that they owe a debt to the developing world, that, that if you like, uh, um, uh, that there is a historic uh, liability to be, to be paid off. And that is too much for, for most uh, developing countries. So um, the net result is that um, this phrase and how it should appear in the, in the document was deeply controversial um, and it was one of the points which could have broken the negotiations. Eventually we, we found a, a drafting solution which uh, uh, keeps it, um, which neutralized the, the, um, uh, the term. That, that was one, one big issue. A second one was the extent to which you could or should change the goals and targets, and I just touched on that a moment ago. Net result was we altered some of the targets just marginally. A third one was how to refer to the separate conference which had taken place in Addis Ababa in July and which focused on financing for development. Again, I won't go into that too much, but uh, suffice it to say that the developing countries coming out of that conference were disgruntled. One particular issue uh, annoyed them intensely, and that was that the, that the, I've used the phrase the Global North, that the Global North was not willing to allow international tax cooperation to be handled at the UN in any significant sense. They preferred it to be handled at the OECD. The developing countries, on the other hand, said this is now a universal agenda. Logically, it should be at the UN. Frankly, you can see uh, you can see merit in both arguments, but the essentially the global north won that argument uh, in in Addis Ababa, and therefore there was a degree of resentment, which played into the final two weeks of our negotiations, um, and indeed threatened to derail them at, at, at one point. So that was a, a big issue. Um, another one was how you should how you would refer to climate change bearing in mind that there is a separate process on that whose outcome is very uncertain. Uh, and again, uh, on, the, on the second last day, we, we found uh, language which, it's a bit tortuous, but it was uh, a compromise across the 193 
uh, member states. Uh, then there were various, um, uh, the, 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 there were issues around the declaration um, which accompanies the goals and targets and which is meant to be a kind of updated version of the Millennium Declaration. Uh, here, um, the, a European perspective was that we need to be able to communicate the goals and targets uh, in the political domain to ordinary men and women, children. We need to be able to make sense of them. Uh, we're not all development experts. I was very sympathetic to that argument, I have to say. But the G77, uh, the developing countries, uh, feared that any, any effort to simplify um, uh, or crystallize the, the, the goals and targets would, would be detrimental to them, and they attach less importance to communication. The net result was a compromise whereby the first page of the declaration is a so-called preamble, and it, uh, it picks out uh, what we call the five Ps, uh, people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnership, and uh, it, it, we eventually uh, achieved a consensus that it was reasonable to present the new framework in those terms, and it makes a number of other points about gender equality, human rights. But that first page is intended to be the short, snappy communication tool on which um, I and others had insisted. Um, so those were there were some there were some very difficult human rights references which had to be resolved in the final stages. Um, this is where the African group, in particular, lashed out against um, uh, concepts which um, the rest of us found quite quite reasonable. Um, uh, one of the the slogans of the of the framework is "Leave nobody behind." We will leave nobody behind, and we will reach the furthest behind first. So this is intended to emphasize um, how inclusive um, and participatory the whole, the whole framework is. But um, many developing countries um, did not want to be, uh, to be tied to uh, particular um, concessions to individual groups, uh, individual minority groups. And uh, so again, that was difficult towards the end. Somehow. Don't ask me how, but we managed to resolve the various problems earlier than expected. Um, we thought that we had a deadline of the 31st of July. We thought that it would actually run until about the 15th of September. Um, in fact, we got it through on the 2nd of August, and uh, there were two all-night sessions. Um, but we, uh, there was no great magic wand. I think there was a lot of luck involved. Um, people were tired. Uh, maybe we had deliberately tired them, uh, and um, uh, and somehow the, they, the various problems which were outstanding. We we set up small uh, groups of key key states, um, and uh, we got gradually to the point where there were only one or two issues. Uh, left and then um, finally on the on the Sunday the second of August um, uh, we got it through and I have to say it was a great moment which I'll always remember because uh, uh, one of the concerns was um, um, that there would be caveats and I see Roy Montgomery at down at the end and Rory and I will both remember the Good Friday Agreement negotiations and uh, in, in a similar situation uh, where. Uh, the, the heads of um, government, well, Taoiseach and Prime Minister and others in the Good Friday Agreement negotiations were being asked to sign up to the agreement, and we were bracing ourselves for caveats, reservations, complications of all kinds, and there was a beautiful simplicity uh, uh, in, uh, when everybody just said yes, yes. And in the same way, um, uh, in these negotiations, the group of 77 um, uh, spoke first when we got to our final session. And then they said simply, the document isn't perfect, but it's as good as it's going to get, and uh, we're going to join the consensus. So then I, I realized that was 134 countries uh, in the bag straight off. So that was a nice, a nice feeling, and it went on from there, and there were no, no uh, reservations. So it meant that there was a good basis for um, the document to go forward then to the heads of state and, and government, and it was duly adopted. Last last month, and I probably long exceeded my time, Tom. But I was no, no, I was going to say just a few words about where we go to from from here, uh, just in, uh, what what happens as it were. Imp the implementation phase is now with us, and that means uh, it'll be a while, to be honest, before we get up to um, uh, speed on this. Uh, there are a number of things. One is that um, in addition to the goals and targets, 
so-called indicators uh, have to be developed. Um, there will be a set of global indicators which will be com completed by next March. This means simply, let's imagine that a target is um, to achieve um, uh, uh, equal access for men and women to third level education by 2030. That's a man, I think that is a target, but let, let, let's take that. An indicator would be number of men and women at third level education in the year 2022 or something. Um, uh, that would be a simple version of an indicator. So it's meant to be an aid to countries to uh, implement the goals. And they will also have their own national and regional indicators. The second thing is that every country needs to consider how it's going to implement them. Uh, uh, the normal route would be put the new goals and targets into the national development plan if a country has one. Already some countries have actually jumped the gun in, in a helpful way. Uh, Colombia, for example, a year ago already put uh, the, the, the then emerging draft goals and targets into legislation um, and uh, uh, to show that it was taking them seriously. So it would be expected that national development plans would now uh, uh, reflect the new agenda uh, in its entirety. Um, another issue is where um, <coughs> governments should locate um, the coordination uh, effort which would be needed to ensure that this vast agenda is, is actually implemented. Um, there would be a certain logic in having it at the centre of government and not, for example, in a foreign ministry or, or a development ministry, and I'm talking internationally now, because um, the, the agenda covers a vast range of domestic issues. There is hardly anything left out. It's health, energy, education, environment, um, oceans, um, cities, uh, um, human rights, uh, gender equality, food security. There is practically nothing omitted from this agenda. Therefore, it doesn't really make sense that you would continue to see it as a purely development um, uh, uh, issue or set of objectives. Uh, but it's for each country to decide on how um, that should be handled. Another um, issue is, is at the... the um, uh, the UN level, there is a body called the High Level Political Forum, which has only met um, uh, a couple of times so far, but it, it's a ministerial group, and it will have the role of supervising implementation at the global level. Um, its next meeting is next July, and between now and then, a lot of the detail about how it will work which we studiously avoided uh, in our document in order to get consensus. Uh, a lot of that detail will have to be uh, uh, agreed, and um, uh, the Secretary General, for example, of the UN has a, a role, and he, he has to produce a report which will make suggestions about how this high-level political forum would work. Um, and uh, um, there will also be, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on national ownership of these goals and targets. So the developing countries on the whole were worried about too many demands being made of them at the global level. They feared, they, they, they actively didn't want the word accountability to feature in the document. They didn't want the word monitoring to feature because they f fear uh, being almost called to account by the developed countries for sins of um, underperformance, and uh, we, we try to reassure them that this is not a legally binding framework, this is only politically binding, morally binding maybe, but it's not legally binding, so there cannot be any sanctions imposed if a country doesn't come up to the mark, but they still fear um, a situation, they fear that uh, ODA would be uh, made available in a uh, diminished way to them if they, if they uh, are not performing adequately. And also there's a practical problem. Many of them are tiny uh, developing states without any uh, central statistics office. Um, uh, they have virtually no capacity to collect data. And data will be essential uh, for all of us in, in monitoring how we're performing with the new goals. Um, there are cross-cutting dimensions to the new goals, such as gender equality. How are you going to measure gender equality as it applies in the environmental area or as it applies in the education area, unless you have very sophisticated um, and very sensitive um, data uh, differentiation, and they call this disaggregated data. So 
the rest of us, frankly, have to help developing countries to bring their own statistical uh, capacities up to scratch so that there will not be nil returns or nearly nil returns when it comes to providing data to the, 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 the global level. So it's, a, it's, a, it, it's in all of our interests to help all 193 member states to be in a position to show what they are doing or not doing. Um, but the emphasis is on a positive collegial relationship. We, the more de the developed countries, uh, want to help the developing countries as part of a collective effort. So my final point is that in the declaration, we uh, and I, I, I'm, the declaration was deliberately couched in sort of visionary, uplifting terms to show the political will behind all this. We emphasise a lot that this is a single collective effort, that the entire world is moving forward in, 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 in one step, as it were, um, and that is we're no longer talking about a north-south, um, slightly patronising distinction where the north is telling the south what it should do, but rather we all are going in the same direction. Uh, to illustrate that, uh, let's imagine, let me come back to my example about um, third level, access to third level education. Take a country, and I'm picking it randomly, in Norway. Norway might, for example, have already achieved that goal, the goal of equal access to third level education. It might have achieved that to, say, 99%, and I'm just inventing this example. Ireland might have achieved it to 98%, but Malawi might have achieved it to 30%. No country, this is the contention, no country would have achieved it to 100%. Every country has some distance to go to meet all of the goals, and therefore, the, we're, having, we're emphasizing this collective uh, march forward, as it were, um, and uh, without any guilt attached or without any finger pointing, this is meant to be um, a single global effort. It's utopian, I'd be the first to, to admit that, but for the moment um, it has seized the imagination and uh, the World Summit or the UN Summit last month certainly expressed a huge degree of commitment and enthusiasm uh, and it's now up to the rest of us to to find ways of, of keeping that momentum going um, uh, over the next few months when it will, in practical terms, take a, t require some effort. It, it, it was, there was never going to be overnight implementation, but we will need to show in a few months that in practical terms uh, all governments have begun to implement it. David,